morning. Good morning. Uh, we're, we're through a difficult part of Hebrews because we consider the Bible important. We teach the books of the Bible. Sometimes you run into some sections that are tough. And sometimes there's some cultural things in there because there's this long argument in Hebrews that you know makes a lot of sense if you look at rabbinic thought, you look at you know uh, Greek rhetoric, which most of you study all the time. But it's kind of deep. It, it's, it can be a little bit. But it's really it is so important, isn't it? And uh, and ultimately uh, it's difficult but important. And we're going to pick up in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 19, and we're going to hit a shorter passage, a little little smaller pericope, if you will, today. It says. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And really, the point of the last few weeks has been understanding in detail the access we now have to God. And again, the argument might, might get a little muddled at some points. Maybe my sermon got muddled at some points. I don't know. But you... It is such an important thing because we have access directly to God because of what Jesus did. Uh, and it says now we can boldly enter. Now, I think the biblical image of this, this boldness, we talked a little of this earlier in the series, is the idea of like king on the throne. And back in the day, if there was a king on the throne, you probably wouldn't like boldly enter, right? Because you might boldly lose your head. Uh, and, and so there's a little bit of like all and uh, I don't know. And, and so when you're approaching God, God is big. God is great. God is, you know, awesome. He's awesomely powerful. And there has to be like a, a hint of, uh, you know, you have to be kind of a little nervous. But then through Jesus, we have access so that we can, we can boldly enter. And um, I, I think of it, you know, kind of like today, you know, you, you, you can... You wouldn't just burst into the Oval Office to see Joe, right? No. Now, many times in my life, apparently, I've forgotten most of them. I've met Joe, you know, and I, I, you know, I've had conversations with him. I mean, we're Delaware. Like, you're a politician walk around at Fourth of July. It's like it's not like other states. I don't. Know, we've had some people here. I'm like, oh, that's your congressman. That's your. They're like, what? They walk in the parades. It's, it's, a, it's a smaller place than, than, than some. But you know, I can't just burst into the office and go, hey, we met once, right? Because there's not that relationship. But through Jesus, our great high priest, it changes the nature of our relationship with God. And so we can enter boldly into his presence. And it says, open a new and life-giving way. Now, the temple curtain was symbolic. It, it separated us. We, we couldn't go into the most holy place, right? Now, it wasn't like the curtain like could stop me. I mean, I've never been like, oh, boy, drapes, I can't get that. Uh, <laughs> oh no, Venetian lines. Uh, but they're, they're symbolic of sort of, we're, we're cut off from that presence. And, and you know, in Matthew 27, you know, kind of jump ahead to the story because we're getting near Easter, right? Uh, in, in Matthew 27, it says this in verse 50, then Jesus shouted again and released the spirit. At that moment, the curtain of, in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, rocks split apart. And so it's symbolic. Jesus' death allows us access to God like never before. The King James actually says it this way. It says, you know, drop, drop a little there for Dana. It says, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain. Yeah. Uh, did they rent Mark Twain? Is that a movie? Yeah. I don't know. It was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. The earth did quake and the rocks rent. Uh, and I read that because I want to read a passage. And this is a great passage, a sermon I, I found. This, you know, I like to listen to sermons, sometimes I like to read sermons. Here's one from 1881, I believe. Uh, 1888, I'm sorry, it was a later version. So I know you all like the 1881 version. Um, you know, you got a sermon that will preach if you read it hundreds of years later. Uh, let me do the math. That's like 140 years. Anyway, it's a long time ago. Not my words, but it's a longer passage. I think it's great. For believers, the veil is not rolled up, but rent, which means torn in two. The veil was not unhooked and carefully folded up and put away so that it might be put in its place at some future time. Oh, no. But the divine hand took it and rent it from top to bottom. It can never be hung up again. That is impossible. Between those who are in Christ Jesus and the great God, there will never be another separation. Who will separate us from the love of God? Only one veil was made, and as that is rent, the one and only separator is destroyed. I would like to think of this. 
The devil himself can never divide me from God now. He may and will attempt to shut me out from God, but the worst he could do uh, would be to hang up a red veil. How would that avail but to exhibit impotence? God has rent the veil, and the devil cannot mend it. I like that. You know, <laughs> there, there is access between a believer and his God, and there must be such free access forever, since the veil is not rolled up and put on one side and be hung up again in days to come, but is rent and rendered useless. And, and so it's it's destroyed. It, 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 it's it's gone. Uh, I love that picture. The veil isn't taken down. You know, like, let's roll it up and put it in the closet. We'll bring it back. It's ripped. It's ruined. And if we had a torn curtain, most of us, as America, we'd throw them out, right? <laughs> or maybe, but it's the curtain that can't be ripped. It, it, Jesus' death forever changes our relationship to God. And we put our faith and our trust in him. There, there is no longer that, that separation. Uh, it says this. So, and since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. So we go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. The thing ultimately keeping us from God's presence wasn't a curtain. It, you know, it was our sin. I, and you know, in our culture, we don't like to talk about sin. Like we want to like make choices and things, and we don't want right and wrong sometimes. And but at his death, the price is paid. We now have access to God. And, and, you know, in our sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. So, and, and so faith it isn't a blind leap. Faith is a confident trust in God. Confident trust in what Christ has done. Confident that I can fully confess my sins to Him and be forgiven. You know. Um, if, if you read the Bible, it, uh, in, in Genesis, there's a story of these two people named Adam and Eve. Uh, and, and there's a lot of things we learn from the story. It, 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 it's meant to teach us some things. And if you read this, if you ever read the story or if you've heard the story, basically, Adam and Eve, you know, they sin. Bottom line. And, and do they know what to do next? They're, they're like hiding from God. Because God shows up and they're hiding. And it's kind of a funny story. Because you're like, how do you hide from God? <laughs> like, I mean, He is God, uh, but, but there's this sort of the shame in their hiding. And then a lot of times, not to play that story all out and talk about all the details, but you know, we do the same because we sin. Sometimes we do things we know are wrong, and what do we do? We kind of hide. It's funny because sometimes I talk to people they won't come to church. Because of their sin. I'm like, oh, it's not like, you know, God doesn't see your sin if it's a home. Like, he only sees your sin at church. Like, if that's the case, some of you would be saints, because you're really good here. <laughs> I saw you driving on the way here. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, Someone's like, God, their sin. But, you know, uh, when we understand and accept this forgiveness, he cleans us up. You know, Jesus already paid the price. It's in our guilty conscience that have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Uh, you know, Christ's sacrifice makes us clean. Now, I, I was thinking of, I, I went to a church when, when I became a believer, and it was like a little more, uh, like a lot of old school hymns and stuff. Uh, and it was, it was fun because, too, I, I used to ride with the bus with this elderly woman, and we would like have just have a hoof in the back of the bus. You always ride the bus on Sunday in Pittsburgh, you know? <laughs> a couple of us. Uh, anyway, but I mean, like, it was like they sang hymns, I have these memories, and it's like, you know, have you ever heard that old, old hymn, you know, Are You Washed in the Blood? Mm -hmm. A couple of you are singing it right now. Some of you are like younger, you're like, I have no idea what this is. There, was, there used to be this book, and it had hymns in it, which are different than hers, and, and there's just there's songs, there was music notes. And those of us who read music, I can read music, but I can't sing or play an instrument. Go figure. Uh, <laughs> I'm good at reading, just not doing it. Uh, anyway, so you know, it's the like old hymns, are you, washed, are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the man, where your garments spot was on the way? Anyone know that song? Like, it, it's good theology. It's a little strange. Like, if you're coming to it from nowhere, you're like, washed in blood? Like, this is like a bad hunting trip. You know, this is a bad trip to New York. But the truth is, but like it's Jesus' blood that makes us clean. 
Which is ironic because I, in my image, I see you know, the, the redness of blood, but then Jesus washes us clean and white as snow with it. it. It's through his sacrifice that, that we're made holy, we're made right. I mean, it just, it, it's this reality of being, we're now clean because of Jesus. Now, I, I, I think I, I think you used it last week, we talked about, you know, anyone have white carpet? You, you have a lot of white carpet in your houses, Calvin? I'm sure it's pretty. I would never have it with children, right? Because why? Because you have children. So you know. Like everything is like sticky. Yeah. Like I remember what's happened with a friend of mine. They're, 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 we're getting ready for something. He's like, you got some money. He's like trying to rub it off me and everything. I'm like, he's like, you have glitter on you. I'm like, oh, that's okay. I just have a, I have a little girl. And then he's like, you kept trying to, I'm like, dude, I have a little girl. There's just glitter on everything. <laughs> Like, and you're not going to get it off. The father did. You only had boys. He didn't understand. Uh, but, you know, kids make a mess. And, and, and honestly, you know, like, white carpet, most of them have white carpet because it gets in. But really, like, heaven is like white carpet. Now, technically, the streets are cold. But, and, but the truth is, we all, we have sin and junk on us. And we, and we have to get clean before we walk in that carpet. Because if you walk in that carpet without being clean, what happens? There's dirt. There's little footprints. And you're like, who did that? Not me. Really? Because it's footprints. They didn't do the thing. Uh, you know, and, and, and I told you about the Appalachian Trail. I, I told this story before. It's like we went hiking, and, and you know, we didn't realize our stink. We bone nose one. Like we were thought we were like, no, oh, a little gamey, but I'm good enough for Taco Bell. My wife would let me get out of the car between where we were and where we went. And it was like, no, you're just going to stay here because you stink. Um, you gotta marry someone who can tell you you stink sometimes. I'm just saying. <laughs> but you know, we needed atonement. We needed a bath. We needed to be cleaned. And Jesus provides that on the cross for us. And so, because of that, because of all that, and because of you know weeks one through however many to get us here, <laughs> let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep His promise. Let, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good service. Let us hold tightly without wavering. And, and, and you know, back and forth, it, it's interesting because, you know, some of the same themes come up in, in chapter four. But, you know, I, I told you the story about strongman. Because you guys know I have a lifelong obsession with picking things up and putting things down. I like to pick things up and put things down. Uh, I met someone new for lunch. It was like we're talking. I, I knew he just wanted to ask me, can you work out? But you know, like, you're never sure if he can. You know, it's like, you know, it's, uh, anyway, it was awkward and funny. But um, I was like, yeah, I, I used to lift. Um, but you know, when, when, I, when I left it, you know, when I did strongman, especially I always wanted to do strongman, uh, and it's, it's basically you're picking up super ridiculous hand heavy stuff. You know, and I remember I had two 300 pound tanks in the yard. They were like old gas cylinders, and there's 300 pounds a piece. And so you pick them up. You know what happens the first time you pick them up? It, it, like your body just rips apart. You're like, oh my gosh, that hurts. But, uh, but if you keep picking them up. You know what almost always gives out in strong man? Hands. Yep, your strength, your hand strength. And, and so a lot of guys, they train, they do all this stuff, but they don't train enough grip strength. I mean, I had, my grip training would take a long time with, with strong man, because all these different things do. Because you, you have to grip, you have to hold firmly. And, and a lot of times, we, you know, we need to hold firmly to these truths because life gets hard. It can be tough. And, and you know, the, the reason is this virtual letter, you know, they're coming into persecution and stuff. You know, they're trying to follow Jesus, and then it gets hard. And, and, and you know, he's like, hey, in light of all that Christ has done for you, you got to grip tight. you got to hold on to these things. And, and, and that's kind of, it's their warning is like our warning too, because life can be hard. There, there are times when faith is hard. There are times when, when having belief and trust in Jesus is not popular. And so we have to grip, we have to hold on to that. Um, and life always done for us, no matter what hits us. Uh, it says, like, without wavering. I, the NIV actually, uh, to read New Living Translation, the NIV says unswervingly. Uh, and I, this is a terrible analogy, but it's the analogy I have. Because uh, you always have this, like in movies, like two cars, and they're like playing chicken. You guys know what the game is. Like it was popular in the 80s, I don't know. Uh, you know, hopefully you don't do it today, especially on the icy roads or anything. I wouldn't recommend it in Wyoming. You know, they'll pull you over. <laughs> but you know, you, you kind of like go really fast at the other person to see who's going to like swerve at last minute. And, and so you got to be confident 
in your path. You don't want to swerve. Uh, you know, and, and so unswervingly, you know, and, and why are we not wavering our hope? Because, not because, like, we're, we're just really good at this, not because we're confident ourselves, but because for God can be trusted to keep his promise. You know, I've seen God faithful in so many things. I've seen God faithful in what he did in Jesus. And so our hope is not based on, you know, my trust in me. Because, you know, I, I will fail. Man, yesterday, they were out. Did you guys see it? I went to Lowe's, they were there. I went to Tractor Supply, and they were there. You know who was there? You know your, your brother's girlfriend was there? You know what they were there? The Girl Scout cookies. <laughs> it's hard to be unwavering. <laughs> I do not trust myself. I had to use extra different emphasis in things. I because because I don't I, I I really like cookies. I like uh what do you like tagalongs? Oh y'all can keep the thin mint, the adding of chocolate and mint together is an abomination. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just didn't have the combination. Guys, yeah, you do you, you do you. <laughs> but, but oh my gosh. And the problem, the problem with Girl Scout cookies is there's only one serving in every box. <laughs> so I can't trust me, right? Because there are times I give in to temptations. There are times I'm not strong. You know, and it can't be based on my trust in you. Because you like the mints. <laughs> it's not based on circumstances, when, you know, because you know, there are times when things aren't going well in life. And you, you can't base your, your, your faith in that. It's ultimately, it's based on my trust in God. Can I trust Him? And He proves faithful through some hard things at times. Uh, and it says, verse 25, And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that David's return is drawing near. Now, I've said this before. I've probably preached this passage before in the context of other things that I can do, kind of more topical series. Preaching this verse is kind of weird. Because you're talking about meeting together to people who are meeting together right now. So maybe I'm only talking to the online folks. No, okay. <laughs> you're doing the best you can. I get it. We're in the middle of the But it's kind of like talking to teachers about the value of education. You know, hopefully, if you're teaching, you value education. Sometimes you get a little jaded in it. But, you know, or like talking to a personal trainer about the value of health. I mean, usually you go to a healthy looking person who's like, oh, they must be a personal trainer. I got a job doing personal training because I was just, I, I lifted a little. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you should probably write workout programs. I'm like, sure. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you know, or talking to an Apple fanboy about an, like an iPhone product, right? Because, okay, who's, who's iPhone? Who's Android? See, and our church can get together. We're, we, you know, it's people who are very different, we, we still love. Uh, but you know, you, you can't talk about an Apple fan about how awesome an iPhone is. Like, you don't have to convince them, right? Because they're just they're sold. Or you know, if you're an anti-Apple people, <laughs> you know yeah, how much better Android is. They're just sold. And so we're talking about the the, the necessity of, of meeting together, of going going to church, if you will, uh, which I don't like to call it that because. You know, but uh, you know, it's, but it's just, let's not neglect our meeting together. Let's encourage one another. It, it's not now. Here's the thing. I look. I, I look to listen to sermons. I was pulling some wood this week, and I, I listen to sermons and things while I'm doing that. Sometimes eighties metal, sometimes sermons. They're almost the same, right? But uh, <laughs> sometimes freedom rock, man. Turn it up. <laughs> Anyone remember that commercial? Yeah, two of us. Okay, <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, uh, you know, it, you know it, um, it's funny because some 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 pastors will use this to guilt trip you into going to every meeting at church that they have every day of the week, right? You ever, you ever you go to church? Like, we just kind of have this pandemic. We still Bible study, but you know, like I've been to churches where you have morning service, you have Sunday school, you have night church. You have Wednesday night, you have a prayer meeting, and it's like, they'll use this to go, don't neglect me together. Don't skip. 
I'm, I'm checking your attendance. There's little stars. Uh, I, I, grew up, I grew up Methodist, not bagging on the Methodist, but like, um, you know, I had this little pin for Sunday school, and it had little gold bars underneath, like perfect attendance, perfect attendance. Perfect. Gave me something to work for, because I'm legalistic anyway. Uh, or my parents made me go. But you know, it, it, like you get credit, because you really love them this, I don't know, I don't know. But like, I think you were allowed like one, or no, you weren't any, I don't know. I can't remember, I was little. But like we would, like when we visited another church on vacation, we'd have to bring the bulletin in to get credit. Because I could get my little gold bar. I wish they were like big gold bars now. I trade them in, but I don't know. But but you know it was you know it can get sort of like, it's not like like we're, we're constantly like checking your attendance or anything. It's, it's not about frenetic Christian activity of being involved in this. And you know I was listening to the guy who's like reading all these statistics, and it's like how many people go to this? And that? I, I think that this is it. No, I don't think he meant it in a bad way, but uh, it's not a, 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 a guilt trip for people to like come to more stuff. Uh, but it is about how we're connected and growing and serving one another. Uh, and, and so, you know, First Corinthians twelve. Uh, if you heard, if you've been read, you know, we all have gifts, and we're part of a body. And, and Paul uses the analogy. It's kind of like, you know, because we, you know, there's different parts of your body. You may or may not have realized this by now. Probably have. You know, like your hands are important. They help you hold on to things, especially heavy things. And your legs are important. Your, your toes are important. Like, it's hard to stand. Uh, you know, if, you, if anyone, like, lose a big toe, I've been told it's, like, you have to relearn to walk because it's, like, you just, you don't walk in the same way. And I've got enough tendons that have snapped. I can tell you where they are and why they're important. I've got a knee that's, like, now a ball joint instead of a hinge. <laughs> uh, I got some issues. And, and the little things that you may not miss when you're missing them, when your knee's, like, instead of, <laughs> You'll, you'll miss things. And, and everything is important. And, and so and Paul says this. He says, and if Peter says I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make any less part of the body? If the whole party, if the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? And, and, and so every piece is important in a body. And every person in the body is important. We have gifts, we have functions. It's, you know, uh, Chop off the ear, it'll hurt. I'll ask Malchus about that time with Peter in the garden. <laughs> and here's the thing. If, we're, if we don't gather, if you're not here, we miss your gifts. Now, the funny thing about that is, like, certain gifts are more visible on a Sunday morning, right? Like, we have people who have musical gifts. We have people who don't. <laughs> you know, I, I get the privilege of, of getting up and, 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 and like, teaching, which I... I love it, and I put a lot of time into studying, I love doing it, it's part of what we do. And so you can kind of walk away going, what, what was I going to do? But we have people doing all kinds of things. We have people who are helping me fix, fix the furnace. We have people who go around and unlock doors. We have people who are teaching kids church right now. We have people who are running nursery right now. And, and those are just some of the jobs, but it's also things like, if you have the gift of encouragement, it's your opportunity to encourage. And so it doesn't have to be an official role, but, but if, if you're not here to encourage people, if you're not here to connect, then that doesn't happen. And so whatever your spiritual gifts are, whatever the things that God's wired you to do, if you're not here, we miss them. We miss you. And, and the church is incomplete. Uh, and ultimately, it encourages us all in the faith. It encourages us to stay strong. Um, you know, it... Church is a place to support one another. Now, I, I've heard this analogy from people. I actually went on the Parks website to verify it because you sometimes you hear things in sermon, it sounds great, and then you're like, oh, that's not actually factually true because it's like someone heard a story who, who heard a story who heard a story who heard a story who heard a story, and then it's like, yeah, that's technically. And I'm a science guy, so I'm like, I'm like trying to verify everything. Anyway, so I was reading all about redwoods this week. Uh, <laughs> You got, you know, the big redwoods, like they cut holes in them, you can drive through them. I, I never went there when I lived in California. I don't know why I didn't go there. Probably because I had no money. Uh, for poor students. Uh, <laughs> that was the poor concept. But, uh, but you know, the, you, you drive through the tree, right? That's pretty crazy when you see the pictures. But here's the thing. They have relatively shallow root systems. What? 
Now, I know a lot about root systems. If you went to our house after the tornado, we saw root systems firsthand. Uh, because the tornado came through and you could see all kinds of root systems. There's a picture, a great picture of Joy, and she's like standing next to that root ball by the garage. And it's like, here's Joy, here's the root ball. <laughs> it was a huge tree. It's like more than six feet in diameter. And, and man, that thing went. Anyway, uh, but redwoods have shallow roots, but they, they kind of grow next to each other and they're intertwined and connected. And, and, and you know, it says that these trees have shallow root systems that extend over. Uh, are 100 feet from the base, intertwining with the roots of other redwoods. So they don't just, they don't go deep, they spread out, they connect. It's interconnectedness that keeps them from like toppling over. And often it's our interconnectedness that keeps us faithful, that keeps us strong. And that's why we need each other. Um, you know, a church is a place to motivate one another. You know, I, there's a great coach, you know, I, I spent a lot of years coaching. You know, you teach, you direct, and you, you motivate. Because some kids have potential in them, and they can't see it. And, and so it's not just about teaching them the moves, but it, it's getting them inspired to, to, to be what they can be. And, and that's, what, you know, we, we motivate one another when we're together. When someone has gifted encouragement, it, like, it's encouraging. That's a joke. <laughs> But, 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 you know, we can inspire one another. And, and great teams, in my experience, the, the teams that often perform better are the ones that are bonded to one another, right? Like, when you're playing for a team and you got skill, you got motivation, and you're bonded, man, it's, just, it's just different. It, it, it's just, it, it, it's fun. You, you go through tough stuff together, but you're, you're there. And, you know, here's the thing. Potlucks. Now it's next week. I know some of y'all gonna miss it. Sorry, we had to reschedule it because of the actual snowstorm. Uh, we didn't do it this week because there, I think there's a, a concert today that has a football game. Uh, Super Bowl, depending, uh, depending on your thing. Uh, we don't want to compete with that. Um, but you know, a potluck isn't about food. Now don't get me wrong. You better bring a dish. No. <laughs> uh, if you bring a dish, that's okay. I love potlucks because I can try some food that I've never had. I try some things. I'm like, I, I didn't know I liked that. I don't even know what that is. You know, can I get the recipe for that? I want to make that later. Uh, you know, I eat food and I, I kind of eat healthy most of the time. But when we're together, I can, you know, just eat whatever. I don't want to offend you. I got to eat that really bad thing that you brought. Right? Can we get an amen? Can we get an amen? Okay. <laughs> but, you know, potluck is just about the food. It's about connecting. You know, and building relationships. We're all over here to spur one another on to faith. Uh, help one another cross the finish line of this thing. Galatians 5.13 says this. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. You know, we have freedom in Christ. But we're made to serve one another with that freedom. And a building community can be hard. It really, it really can. Because we're all a bunch of people who are a little different. You know, and some of you are more different than others. Uh, John 13 says this. Jesus says, I, I, I've read this to you a bunch of times. You should know this one. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So it, it's not because, you know, you don't know my disciples because you have a Sunday school pen with a little... Thing that's coming on. I'll bet mine's longer than most of yours. A couple of you might have had it longer than I. Well, I'll just find mine. It's in a box somewhere. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have False Pride Sunday. We'll all go to the falsely proud of it. Uh, you got me? Yours probably wraps around the block. <laughs> you were a good kid. I just kind of tapered off a little more. Uh, and then Jesus. What God? Okay. Uh, you know, it's not always natural love one another, but, but, but it's, it's what we should do. And I, I, I kind of alluded a little bit in my mind. Galatians 3.28, uh, I love this. Galatians, man, that's a powerful book. Who hears this when we preach that? That's good stuff in there. You should read it. There is no longer Jew or Greek. Now, uh, uh, there, I'm sorry, I'm reading a different translation in my head. Uh, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham, you are his heir, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. There's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, 
because you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, Pius Q of the day would thank God daily that he was not made a Gentile, a slave, or a female. That shows you how big the divides were, right? These, like, we read this and we're like, yeah, because we didn't understand the divisions. We got other things we divided in our country about, so you just think about that one. <laughs> uh, political stuff, racial stuff, we got it. Uh, but all those things, you know, they represented the deepest divides in ancient society. And, and the thing which separated us all is gone. Christ removes the dividing wall. It, it, it's a radically different thing. And, and the church, uh, someone at, I heard this once, or I said this once, I don't know, I found it in my old notes. Church is a band of natural enemies who love one another for Jesus' sake. You ever, like, sit here, look around, and say, you're about around. Do you see anybody that you can hang out with unless you were at church? If you're saying, if you say no, you're lying. <laughs> and that's a sin, you need to repent. No. <laughs> because... Naturally, you know, we might not get along. We might not hang out. We probably, without Jesus, we're definitely not coming together at 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning to sit here. Right? But there's all these things that naturally divide us. But in Christ, all of his barriers are taken away. And, and you know, it's, uh, church is made up of natural enemies, not natural friends. I mean, you should bring your natural friends too. But, but the point is, you know, you can get along with people. iPhone users can love Android users. In Jesus. You know, I don't know, I, I, I can't even remember who's playing the Super Bowl today, but those fans can love those fans. Steelers fans can love Eagles fans. Can I get an amen? Um, I got a story, I'm not getting off, I'll, I'll tell you about a story later. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, often, it's often said, don't go to church, be the church. You ever heard that? Yeah, I've said that. Uh, but here's the thing we can't be the church if we're not gathered together, the two. Uh, and that's why we call it, we actually, I sometimes word things in awkward ways because I always like to call it the gathering time, the, the work, because I don't like to call it church, you know, and, um, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's the, you know, here's the church, here's the steeple, open up, see all the people, it's all lies. Um, because, you know, it's cute to teach your kid, and then people are like, oh no, I call that my kid. But it's like, uh, you know, here's the, <laughs> it's, it's not about the steeple, it's about the people. Right, church is is the people, and, and often people are like, hey, where's your church? And I'm like, well, I think most of them are at work right now, but I think some work evenings. And the people are like, no, no, I mean, I know what you mean. And, I, and sometimes I'll mess up too, and I'll say, I'll call this church. And this is a church building, right? The building is cool. We're in the middle of buying it. Oh my gosh, there's a lot of paperwork in buying a church. Oh my. Every time I think it's done, it, it, it rears its ugly head. Uh, we're, we're getting close. We're getting close. And then we'll have, we'll, we'll own an HVAC system that needs a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> you see us running around on Sunday morning? It's usually to fix something that's broken. So I invite you, if you have any physical gifts, to, to, to help us. Uh, if not, uh, well, okay, that's cool. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but community takes time. Uh, there's, a, there's a popular sitcom. I was going to name it, and I didn't feel like it. Uh, but you know, two people are meeting, and uh, they're like, they're talking about, you know, uh, the, the church going, something from going to church once a year. And, and, and they say, I don't object to the concept of a deity, but I'm baffled by the notion of one that takes attendance. And it, it's kind of cheeky, but, but the point, I think people miss it. Again, you know, the little bars. You know, it wasn't a bad, it didn't start out as a bad thing. It was like encouraging people to, to come together for a good purpose. And then it goes all about pride. Do I have, but the, the, you know, I'll bring it in sometime. You can Google it. I think someone Googled it last time I talked about it. But, uh, you know, it kind of, you know, it's, it, it, the point of church is not like God's taken attendance. Church is for us. Church is for us to help him fulfill uh, his purpose of us. The church is for us to encourage one another. The church is for us to express our gifts and to help us because it helps us when the times are hard. Um, there's, a, there's a story I read years ago. It, it struck me, and it was a guy who didn't go to church for a while. And um, so the pastor goes by and visits his door. That was like pre-COVID when people just showed up at people's houses. 
uh, you know, and the guy's like, I'm not going to say anything. I want to make a pastor say something. And the pastor's like, I'm not going to say anything. I'll let this guy say something. So they sit down. They just sit down. Don't say anything. He answers the door, lets him in. And they just sit there by the fire. Because the picture is like nature. So, you know, fire go in. And they're just sitting there for a while. Silence. And the pastor finally reaches over with a shovel. Wax no. <laughs> reaches over, gets a coal out of the fire, and sets it you know, kind of on the, the bricks outside of the fire. They sit there and sit there. It's kind of like, if you know much about fires, the coals eventually they go from like red hot to they just kind of darken. There's just a piece of charcoal. He goes dead. Pastor takes the shovel, puts it back in the fire on the other coals, and lights back up. He gets up, walks to the door. And the guy says, I understand. I'll be there next Sunday. <laughs> Because we need each other to keep burning. And, 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 and so church attendance isn't about a guilt trip. It isn't about a deity who keeps attendance. It isn't about little Sunday school bars. But the reason we need to gather is we need the strength of one another. You know, I've often like it to like working out. Um, I didn't make it on the bike this week and my schedule was crazy. And guess what? Because no one met me and made me do it, I didn't bike it. Right? Horrible. But, you know, if I'm meeting a group of guys to, to, to bike, or girls, because uh, some of them now bite me. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's easier to keep going, right? And there's a camaraderie to that. And, and church is supposed to be the same thing. It's something to encourage and to help us burn. You know, ultimately in Christ, we have a God who gets you. We have a God who can help you. We have a God who gives us hope. Uh, and ultimately, we can come and find a rest in Him because we have that full access to God. Uh, 